Hi, everyone. Are you still awake? Yes. Excellent. Ex huh? What about even bushy-tailed? Well, bushy-tailed, definitely. <laughs> so, um, so my name is Danny, and I'm going to talk to you today about documenting design patterns for cross-functional teams. Um, to give you a little bit of background on me, um, if my clicker thingy will work. Why aren't you working? Why are you no worky? Hold on. Ah, well. Um, so, <laughs> what? What happened? All right, hold on. Send to both. Is that working? No. Damn it all. Hold on. Oh, okay. Ah! <laughs> what? Okay. Really? Okay, good. All right, good. All right. Hi. Um, okay, so anyway. Wow, I'm really loud, aren't I? Hold on. Is that a little better? Okay, cool. Um, so a little bit about me. I have been in the Drupal community for a very long time as a um, first as a site builder and designer, um, then as one of the co-organizers of this event, um, then as a writer of books, and now I am a recorder of videos. Um, my current focus is on user experience design and design research. I do that through Harvard Business Review, um, where I actually work with a um, very, very cross-functional product team of marketers and editors and developers and designers and happy, happy, very, very smart people to make HBR.org a better place. Um, I'm also the, do the, the mother of this little diva, who many of you might have seen running around earlier today. Um, she makes my life very interesting. Uh, so, one of the things that happened to me when I started at HBR was I realized that I was stepping into an organization that had a lot of history. The first issue of Harvard Business Review was created in 1923, and it was originally an academic journal, almost exclusively, and it was meant to provide a, um, a groundwork for the knowledge of how to do management, how to do leadership. And it was really very much a scholarly journal. In 2011, 2012, we actually went on this undertaking of a complete overhaul of our brand to turn us into a consumer magazine. So now we're still presenting scholarly research and, and interesting information about management and leadership and all of the big ideas and how we do business around the world, but it's really meant for the average professional as opposed to the business school professor. Um, so it was a huge, huge shift. And as part of that, we started to go digital. And in 2010, we had a fairly standard media website. It was a desktop, mostly it was a desktop-based design. I'm pretty sure it used a 960 grid, if you guys remember that. Um, we had an M dot site, which our front end developer still chuckles at every once in a while. Um, and it served us really well for a few years, but we realized um, somewhat smartly in about 2013 um, that mobile was the future. And we realized that 61% of executives, and these are our primary audience, executives, mid-level managers, people who are early in their career and want to get to the next level, 61% of executives use mobile devices primarily to consume content that's interesting to them. So news, opinion articles, that kind of thing. And 43% of them access it through a browser or social app as one of the first things they do every day. So this is a huge, huge market for us. And so what happened is my boss, who's the director of digital strategy, said, you know what? We need to redesign our website. We need to revisit this. We need to go responsive. We need to go mobile first. And so in 2014, um, a month before I started the job, 
we launched a brand new responsive site. And what we have found since launching this website, other than usability issues, um, is that our traffic has shifted dramatically since the launch of the website. It used to be about 71% of our traffic was coming on desktop, 21% on smartphone, and now that is starting to flip. And we are starting to see that 37% of our stuff, uh, of our content is being viewed from a smartphone and almost half of our traffic on weekend comes from, on the weekend comes from mobile devices. So we're seeing a huge, huge lift. We're also seeing a massive increase in people coming to us from social media sites like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. And that's happening because those companies are prioritizing sites that are mobile friendly. How much of that is because of your redesign and how much of that is just general trends? Um, it's both, frankly. Um, it's both. So general trends, and actually this feeds right into my next slide. Um, 39, 39 of 50 of the most popular news sites had more mobile than desktop visitors at the beginning of this year. What we have seen in our analytics is that a massive, a massive uptick of people visiting our site on a mobile device, primarily on a mobile device. And part of that is that it actually works on a mobile device, whereas it didn't before. Um, but then part of that is also a broader trend and the fact that Facebook, Google, almost every engine that provides a feed for content actually gives you a boost if you have a mobile-friendly site. So Facebook, for example, has changed their algorithm so more people will see your stuff if you have a link to a responsive site. So that has provided a huge lift for us. So the process of creating this site, and a lot of this happened before I arrived on the scene. Like I said, this site had been launched, had been live for a month when I started my job. Um, part of how they created this redesign and tried to take a mobile first approach was through using atomic design. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's 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 a phantom. Yeah, it's a phantom. It come it cuts in and out. Every once in a while it just decides to be cranky apparently. <laughs> so our solution was atomic what was atomic design and um, I believe that someone as a matter of fact I think Jason the first person who presented talked about pattern lab um, and the ability to essentially take a design from its little little bitty basic tags to components to sections of a page to entire templates and then into the pages themselves we use pattern lab at, throughout the production of this site to basically rapidly generate pieces of our site and the templates that we used. And there were some fantastic things about this. First of all, um, it was based in the actual CSS that was on the site, which was fantastic. It also made it really easy for us to, to work in a mobile first way because you could actually switch between views without having to redo the code. So we loved that. And the biggest piece of it was we actually were able to create repeatable, reusable design patterns that would allow us to really rapidly, ideally, really rapidly iterate new features as marketing came up with yet another fantastic thing that had to be on the site. Um, so there were a lot of really nice things about using Pattern Lab. But one of the things that I'm realizing happens with almost any style guide solution that focuses on site CSS is that designers, for the most part, don't actually think in CSS. And these solutions assume that all of the people using this particular tool are front-end developers. So we have a team of very smart and very talented designers who are doing things for our site in a regular base, on a regular basis, and this is how they think. They think in font specifications. They think, although this is getting better, <laughs> in full screen Photoshop files that are annotated as a specification. This is improving, 
But this was a huge shift for them, trying to think in this component-based approach. Um, we also have editors who have to put articles into our website who occasionally need things to look a specific way. So our front-end developer was giving them this and telling them to put that into the website's code. So we had some serious issues in basically making this a tool that everyone who was working on the site could actually use to create good hy web hygiene, let's just say. Um, on top of this, and this is my personal favorite, um, so we are using essentially, um, the best way that I can describe it is decoupled WordPress. I will not say headless, thanks to Preston. No problem. So we actually go from, from the front end section. So imagine that you are a front end developer. You receive this beautifully mocked up and annotated spec from the visual designer. You put it into Pattern Lab, and then you have to take the stuff that you did in Pattern Lab and transfer it to an FTL file, which is the templating language that we're using. I'm not really sure what it is, but I believe it's Java. So you have to take it from Pattern Lab to the FTL file, then it goes to the QA server. And then if someone notices a problem, then the change is gonna be made in the FTL file, and then back to QA, FTL, back to QA. What happens to Pattern Lab? Nothing. And so what we saw was complete inconsistency across the board between what was in Pattern Lab and what was actually on the site because the two weren't connected at all. But then furthermore, we had patterns that would say, for example, what does a flyout box look like? What does a help text message? What does a system confirmation look like? We did not have anything that described what these messages should say, how they should be written, what kind of voice they should use. And so for a while, and thank God we fixed this, we were telling people on our paywall, I'm sorry, you used up all of your articles as an anonymous user this month. We have another page that says, if you are an hbr.org registrant, you should go here. When was the last time you visited a site that called you an anonymous user? What was your opinion of that site <laughs> when they called you that? Um, so these were the things that I started noticing. I also started noticing that the way that we were putting together atoms and molecules had no bearing on the background that they would be against. Which considering how many images we use on our site seems a little stupid. Um, and I don't think anyone meant to be stupid. It's just sort of what happened. Um, so we had a conundrum. We had to figure out how do we fix this situation that we're in. Because we like the idea of using Pattern Lab, we like the idea of having a website that people go to as a document of you know, what they should do in order to not be horrible to people on our site, um, and how to make front end and design much more efficient throughout the organization. But we didn't want to get stuck in a situation where we're creating extra work throughout the production cycle just to make sure it gets documented. Uh, so, we started by revisiting the purpose of this style guide. And we realized that we cannot live in a world where the style guide is just for the front end developers. Because first of all, the designers are not working in code. They're not going to work in code, and it, that is okay. So we need to create a set of components that they can use that are templated for them, that the, that the developers understand, okay, when, you, when it looks like this, you mean this. You mean to use this class. Um, we also needed to be able to say, okay, well, when we have a system message, these are the kinds of words we should use. These are the kind of words we should never use, 
like registrant. And that way we don't have to fly around the building getting approval from every single stakeholder for every system message. Because frankly, that never really worked. And developers would write system messages, as you can see. So we also considered what are the alternate use cases? Who are the other people who might at some point be using this? And one of the things that most teams sort of forget about is that usually there are contractors or other designers or interns or third party folks who come in and do things on your website. And they kind of need to know how to do the things that they need to do on your website. Um, and often that usually gets relegated to this very internal knowledge that someone is very annoyed at having to give you because he's so busy. So we wanted to make sure that we actually accommodated and made it very, very clear for these people who are ostensibly very new to our organization, these are the guidelines that we go to. And we also started thinking through what a style guide really was meant to be. It's not just about the CSS classes. Those are important, but it's not the point. Um, it wasn't necessarily about what a system message or an alert looks like. Those are important, but they're not the point. The actual interface elements that someone can pick and choose from to create a layout, that's a huge piece of it. The typographic hierarchy, the way that a page should flow, especially considering that we are essentially a content company. Very, very important. And how we speak to people through our interface was vital. So we started by looking at a number of different style guides. And I've put I've put a bunch of ones here. The only one I didn't put here, we used MailChimp. Um, both their main design pattern website and voiceandtone.com, which is a fantastic example of how, uh, of how system messages should be. Um, we use them very, very heavily. The other one that we used very heavily for inspiration was actually for a company called Patients Like Me that I worked at before I, um, before I worked at Harvard. And they had a fantastic style guide that actually had their personas in it which I personally, as a UX designer, just beamed um, when I saw. So these were sort of the places that we looked for inspiration. And then we started by actually coming together and decide, OK, what are the actual principles that we're going to use to guide our design decisions? And what is the actual goal of this? We can't just do this because we need to. We need to have some kind of philosophy that we're all, um, that we're all working with. Um, so we documented those as the first page of the pattern library so that anyone coming in can say, yes, okay, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. And then we started actually revisiting the patterns we have. Now, this is actually something we're still doing. We are still sifting through all of the patterns that we collected during the process of building the site and cycling out ones that we don't use and sort of revisiting the ones that we do. So we did workshops with design and with front end. This is my front end developer, Daigo, who's very, very fun. Um, and that worked pretty well. But at a certain point, we realized that there were a lot of things there were a lot of things we were doing that were just focused on what things should look like. And any of us who are designers, as much as we enjoy things being beautiful, it's not about making it pretty. It's about making an experience that someone is going to want to have again. And that goes far beyond the visuals. And so we started thinking about system messaging and interface copy. How, we do use it, how do we document how we do usability testing? Are there interaction standards we have? So we're not using one interaction pattern here and another one over here. So we started, so, so admittedly, I sort of started pushing stuff into Pattern Lab a little too aggressively because I know how to code. And I know how to use Git. And they were very excited about that uh, until uh, one day. 
uh, this one developer who I love dearly, um, but I also call him Grumpy Cat, um, said, okay, why is, why is user research in here? That's not, that's not design. All right, okay. calm down. <laughs> and when I said, well, like, we need to be able to document, you know, the things that we're finding so we can sort of document the process. Oh, well, we've been trying to make the wiki a place for that stuff. <laughs> that, that nobody has ever read. Like, I'd been there, like, six months. I'm like, oh, really? When was the last time you used the wiki? Oh, I haven't been in long. Yeah, that's why it's not going in there. <laughs> um, so we are still evolving the process of how we document the stuff that we do. Uh, one of the things that we have um, moved forward, we've actually had several meetings now to sort of reorganize the style guide and revisit it and figure out what this thing is going to be. Um, we have finally settled on the fact that interaction, that that interface copy is absolutely going in the style guide. Um, and that we're going to be revisiting specifically system messaging and alerts because that's something that we clearly forgot in the rush to make it beautiful, which a lot of, um, frankly, we're not the first development team who's ever done that. Um, so we're still working on that. But I wanted to share with you sort of a process that you guys can hopefully take from this in order to create your own style guide. Because Pattern Lab, I will say, is a fantastic tool. It is a fantastic tool. But it's not enough. It's not enough to just put a bunch of styles on a page and a bunch of color swatches on a page and then think that everyone's going to know how to design. Um, so that's actually the first step, is to figure out not only your audience, um, you want to make sure you understand the entire audience, not just the front-end developers, not just the designers. Yeah, Benji. Yes, absolutely. Um, because, because a lot of times people create them as extremely internal documents. Um, I liken it actually to the site builder who never comments their code because they assume they're the only person who will ever touch it. And then they forget the human capacity for boredom. And don't realize that eventually someone else will own this site. <laughs> Unless it's your portfolio, someone else will own this site someday. Um, it's the same with your style guide. If you assume it's just for you, it's only going to be for you. If you assume that what people need is code is code samples, and your team, your design team, is not working in code, what value have you provided with this style guide? Um, so you really want to think through who the people are who are actually going to be consuming this information and what you want them to know. You also want to align on the actual purpose of the style guide. So with atomic design, the style guide serves two purposes. One is to set a foundation for what experience you're actually creating. What are the standards that we hold ourselves to? What is our, um, a lot of people call it a North Star. What is it that we as an organization strive to do for the people who use our product? But we also are creating a repository of interface elements that are actually representations of what the elements look like in our product. So any person who is creating a new feature or who is implementing something else can easily take these components and move them together to create a new feature, a new function, anything, and we have cohesion among the whole, uh, um, cohesion among the product? Cohesion within the product. Cohesion. You have cohesion. Um, but ultimately, a good style guide also makes you as a team much more efficient and much more efficient at creating a good, consistent 
experience for the people who use your product. From there, you start with the basics. All right, so these are the things like your colors, your type styles, your form elements, grid, image sizes, icons. MailChimp's design pattern library, by the way, great, great resource for just what the structure should be um, because they organize it very well. And a lot of the automated style guide tools like Nile Style Sheets and Hologram and like all of these other things that sort of rip comments out of your CSS and dump the style guide on the page, they're a really good resource just for this. But you also have to think about the building blocks of your pages. So you have to think about things like content teasers, sidebar widgets, what do search results look like? In Drupal, what do taxonomy pages look like? How many times have you built a site or seen someone build a site and they completely ignored the taxonomy page? All the time. So, so don't do that. Don't let that happen to your users. Think through those things and document them. And from there, you can actually build up to the templates that house your content. So most templates will be fairly familiar. Like a blog post is probably going to have the same stuff. And many pages are going to have the same structure. But it's really nice to have a certain subset of this is what an event looks like. This is what a blog post looks like. This is what the store looks like. Um, that you can use and then you can reference as you're creating new features. And then this is the piece that most style guides forget. You have to establish some kind of guidelines for how you talk to people through your product. And most importantly, you must not assume that your product has a copywriter or that only the UX designer is writing copy and the developers would never, ever write copy for a system message, ever. They never do that. You have to assume that anyone in your building could potentially be writing something that will eventually be seen by someone coming to your website. And you don't want them to be called a registrant. You don't want them to be called an anonymous user. You want to find some other thing to call them that a human being who is an adult, <laughs> often with a college education, would like to be referred to as. Um, but then it's also things like marketing emails. We send tons of marketing emails and they're super, super formal. Or we'll send instructional emails to people that have like four paragraphs of instructions in like eight point Verdana. Um, our VP of marketing calls them word walls. That's a, that's a lovely word wall. Oh, look, there's a button. So then I know I must click it. Um, you have to find ways to establish standards for how you're actually going to talk to people through your website. And then the last step is really to socialize this and to get it out into your organization. It's not enough to share it with your front-end developers, share it with your designers. You absolutely have to start referencing it in design reviews. You have to send it to third-party vendors who are creating things for your, for your product. Um, you want to use it repeatedly as you're actually designing things. So one of the things that we do very, very well um, at HBR is whenever there's a new feature, we start looking through the patterns and saying, okay, so you know what? We can probably use the search results pattern here. Let's just pop this over here. And you know what? This would be a really good time to actually change the way that we're using that, those filters and to change the way that those filters look because nobody can see them. So let's use this and fix it. And once we fix it here, it fixes everywhere else. So one of the things that's really wonderful about having a style guide that actually reflects what's on your website is that you can actually use every new feature as an opportunity as an opportunity to improve the entire site because when you have those when you have those standards in place you can say you know what i don't think this standard's really working let's see what we can do here that will improve things in here and here as well
So, the muscles. that's all I have to say. Anything because else? for some reason, every time I have a 45 minute presentation, I can only talk for half an hour. <laughs> no matter how many slides I put in. So, I would like to open up the floor to questions. I will ask um, Leslie, is there another like um, microphone so that people can be heard that you know of? Oh, sure, fine. I'll repeat the questions. Yes, yes. <laughs> Show your work. All right, yes, I will repeat the questions so we don't have to worry about passing around a microphone. Anyone? Yes. This solves the problem you mentioned earlier that there was a disconnect between the um, pattern lab and the QA FTL iteration. Um, in the sense, yes, in the sense that. Um, in the sense that we stopped trying to build up patterns in Pattern Lab. So what we started doing after, um, after a while is that we just stopped, we stopped putting templates in Pattern Lab. Like we would do it occasionally, but it would be more of sort of an iterative process. Um, one of the s side effects of that, unfortunately, is that we're doing a little too much with Photoshop. So it's getting kind of, it's getting a little problematic. So you can't like build up immediately from like mobile to code or mobile to desktop. So it's not as responsive as we'd like. Um, but we also have been doing a lot of prototyping in Axure so you can sort of mimic that responsiveness. Um, the biggest thing that we had to do in order to really make Pattern Lab work the way we needed it to was we actually had to um, decouple it from our production CSS. Because one of the problems that was coming up was that um, our front end developer was using it very similarly to the way some Drupal, um, Drupal designers use it, where you basically put Pattern Lab in your theme layer, like in your theme folder, and then you build it up, and then that eventually sort of becomes your template, which is awesome except when you're playing. So, <laughs> so we had to get rid of that. So we now have basically Pattern Lab feeds in the compiled CSS from our website as opposed to um, going straight to production. That was a slide I actually removed. Don't touch! That'll go right to the site. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question. Like we basically changed our process. And we focused much more on the building blocks and much less on here's the page template. Anyone else? So you have the group going so back think about no, the mm -hmm. like Yeah. Can you like, have you taken that group back further? Yeah, so I mean, our process now, like we're still, you know, one of the tensions that I think you always have with well-trained designers is that sometimes they can get very, very focused on what they call visual fidelity. So, like, even when you've got well-established design patterns, and I saw, I've seen this at several places that I've worked at, even when you have well-established design patterns, for some reason, it doesn't connect in their head that when I say this, I mean this. And so part of this process has really been about trying to build up more trust between the design team and the front end, and the front end developers that, no, it's actually okay. Like, you don't have to do pixel perfect. Like that's not a concept that actually exists in the modern web. So like we can let that go. And we can say we're going to use this design pattern here. And here's like an okay enough representation. Um, and it's also required some retraining on the part of the internal stakeholders because a lot of that obsessiveness with visual fidelity has been driven by stakeholders saying well Wait a minute, what is this? The font's all different. <laughs> so, like, so, you know, I had, like, I, I actually, and this is kind of a funny story, um, to me anyway, I was in a meeting where literally the only change to our existing design pattern was the addition of a button. Little, like, 
dollar sign, this is buy copies. Like, that's all. But I show, like, here's a stream item with this, and it was if, and it was with these, like, placeholder fonts that I had because I couldn't get access to the real fonts on the site. And they're like, oh, wait, I need to have a meeting about this because this looks totally different than what I thought, you know, what, like, there's a whole bunch of other things I have questions about. And we're sitting in the meeting, at, like, and I said, okay, that's fine, but just, just know, literally the only change to the current experience is the addition of this link. Okay. We get into the meeting and she's like, okay, and so, like, wait a minute, is it going to be this font? Like, why does it look like this? Why is it this font? Is, it, is this where it's going to be? Like, is it going to be on the line with here? Is it going to be underneath? And she's, like, asking all of these nitpicky questions. And this is one of the editors. This isn't even the designer. And so a lot of, a lot of our current, a, a lot of our current challenge really involves restructuring some of those conversations so that people can think more conceptually and think more about what I call functional fidelity. So it's not about what it looks like. It's about how it works. It's about the interaction pattern. Let's focus on that because you know what? Once we get to code, we will have the visual fidelity. And if it doesn't work, well, the designers and the front end developers sit 100 feet from each other. They can figure that out among themselves. And they do. Much more now than when they used to. Um, so that's been a huge part of the style guide process. Now that we're actually inviting the designers in and giving them ownership over it, they actually feel much more comfortable walking up to the front end developer. And the front end developers feel much more comfortable walking over to them and say, hey, can I show you something? And like they're actually starting to work together collaboratively now, um, which was really difficult for them before. Any other questions? If you contract it to whatever the heck this is. No? It's a dishwasher. Red lines fast? No, God no. Oh god no. No, no. Those are actually like those will put in Jira tickets. <laughs> but we tend not like I and I never do. Um, I never do. Typically what I do is I will either like there's two strategies I have. One is I do an actual prototype. So I will do an actual prototype, output it to a link, and then send people to the link. And then I'll take like notes on the actual prototype. Uh, that I'll do for anything that's like slightly complex. And the design team is actually been has actually been learning Axure, which has been fantastic. Um, they're still sort of in that grumpy learning curve phase. Um, <laughs> but they're they're really like pushing the boundaries of it, which is very exciting to see. Uh, the other thing that I tend to do, and I'm doing this more and more, is I actually go into Chrome and inspect Element and then just mess with the code. Because <laughs> I know all the helper classes, so I'm just like, tee, 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 and then I like take a screenshot of it, pop it into a Jira ticket, and then say, here's the code, and dump it in <laughs> into a comment. And that's really nice because we have a remote team that handles a lot of like break, break fix stuff, and you have to be very, very literal with them. So if I can if I can say here's the code go put this into a ticket like go go put this into the website, <laughs> then they do it and it works out fine. So those are like my two strategies. Um, I will use the inspect element method mostly when I'm adjusting like a quick layout on a static page, or when I'm changing the text on a message, and saying this is what it should be, not this other thing that we have. Yes. <laughs> Here you go. Um, so I think it's interesting because some of it, we're still trying to work that out because we have a lot of different third party vendors and we're still, I mean, we're still honestly evolving the style guide itself. So, so part of it is we don't really have it finished yet. Um, no, not really. But like it's messy right now. Like it's it's like a hot mess right now. Um, it's getting better, but like it's going to take a little while. Um, but no, I mean typically like you still want to do a design kickoff whenever you're working with any kind of third party vendor. You want to give them the sense that like this is you know what we're expecting. Um, I think that the biggest 
benefit to doing style guides this way as opposed to the typical way, which is just sort of shoving all of the components in and maybe you name them, maybe you don't, um, is that it really sets the stage for what this thing is and who you're designing for. Whereas, like, it's very easy to just dump a bunch of interface elements on a page and then there's no guidance on how to use it or when, which is tragic <laughs> um, in a lot of ways. Anyone else? Yeah. I would just say you can add to your brand list mm -hmm. with the not to do, which mm. is brand.uber.com, which has got to be the worst brand style guide I have seen in the last century. Really? It's wow. Um, it's, Let's add one to the list of problems Uber got has. the best interaction failures I've ever seen on a site worth a billion dollars. So it's got to be style <laughs> Nice, yeah. I like it. So if you want to, you, you can roll that as an anti-pattern or an anti-pattern. Yeah. Very nice, very nice. Well, I like I was, you know, I've been trying to be unsmart, like unsnarky, and say like we should always use red text on a yeah. black background. Like okay. that's just always what we should do. And oh, gray on gray, that's fun. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just going to like make you guys look at Liz Lemon again. Um, <laughs> but there, but, but yeah, like, I mean, that's part of the, that's part of the challenge, isn't it? Because when we talk about these patterns, a lot of us think of them as interaction design. We think of them as like just building blocks, like form elements are a great example. Form elements, a lot of people think, are just very, very basic things. But when you don't set some kind of standards for how are forms validated, what kind of system, like what kind of feedback does someone get? How do we let people know what's happening with their data? Um, when you don't set standards for those things, it has a huge impact on the ability of your users and your customers to trust you. And so that's a huge piece of it. And what's fascinating to me is how many style guides will either completely neglect or question why form elements have to be a thing in their style guide. And or alternately, they will dump all of the form elements on a page with no context, no information. Here's what a drop down looks like. Nothing else. Um, and I just feel some like I just feel like that's a disservice to the people who are actually building your site, frankly, because nobody is inherently a bad person. Nobody wants. Like, unless maybe you're Donald Trump. Like, nobody wants <laughs> bad things to happen to you. Um, like how he did that? Um, but nobody wants bad things to happen to the people who use their products. But if you don't provide any kind of guidance, or even worse, if you assume that your front-end developers are just so stupid that unless you have very, very specific guidance, they'll just make things horrible, um, which I've also seen happen. Like, what kind of environment does that set up for the product? How does that help your team succeed? You. <laughs> yeah. You got to put in Microsoft. Yeah. No, I'm not. <laughs> Yeah. Oh gosh. Nice. Yeah, if you're changing one memorial drive, one memorial drive. Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah. Well, actually, that sounds like a Google Maps fail I had. Yeah, I used to. Yeah, and I actually used to do. Um, this is like another sort of story. I, um, I, when I first got out of maternity leave, I had a contract at Berkeley College of Music, and. I had my like second interview, and mind you, like my child is like three months old at this point. I'm com a complete mess, like just every in every possible way, um, and somehow managed to get my stuff together. Managed to finally get my babysitter who was late, and like left the house, put um, 186 Mass Ave into my GPS. I said Boston. I ended up basically in Central Square. And I finally get a parking space. I'm like, OK. And then I go, and it's like this weird locked up building. <laughs> and I'm like, this doesn't seem right. And so I called the woman I was interviewing with. And this was like my second interview. And I'm like, so I'm at 186, and it looks like a locked building. And she's like, are you in Boston? I'm like, no, I'm in Cambridge. And she's like, we're in Boston. You knew this was Boston. Like she, she was very, she was a very um, terse. Yes, yeah, she was very terse. Um, but yeah, so basically, what happened was, no matter what I did, if I typed in 186 Massachusetts Avenue, Boston, it sent me to Central. Like for some reason, Google Maps was allergic to the Smoot Bridge. I don't know what happened, but yeah. Um, I don't think a style guide could actually fix that, by the way, but um, yes. <laughs> Going back to this. You're tracking the specific implementation or what the implementation should uh -huh. your body. Are you tracking the non-obvious answer pattern anywhere? As in, like, oh, you might want to do this, but no. Um, sometimes. I mean, there are some companies that do that within their style guide. The way that we're handling that right now, um, there are some places where we really need where we really need to get more specific. So one really big like one really obvious one is this. <laughs> like these two two areas like we know to be a problem. Um, and we haven't resolved it yet. Um, but some of the ways like some of the big ways that we're resolving that is with microcopy. Um, an interface copy. And so we actually have, and MailChimp has in their um, copy styles, um, use this word, not this word. So we found like a list of words that were used on the interface that never, we never want ever used. I'm sure you guys can guess a couple of them. And so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't yeah. So like basically, we would say this. We would say we would not say that. Say this, not that. Um, not yet. Um, and generally speaking, we don't document like revision history. Like we don't care if this is what the pattern used to look like. This is what it looks like now. Um, and that honestly has kept us very focused, which is a good thing. So let me tell you about working memory <laughs> and long-term memory. There's only so much information that one person can include in their brain at any given time. <laughs> and you just, like, it's just not worth it. Like, it's not worth it. Like, what we want to deal with what we have now. <laughs> Hey! <laughs> Internationalization with style guides. So tell me more. Um, that's a really good question. I haven't run into that specifically, but I think that that would be, I mean, that would be a really interesting exercise because one of the things like we definitely don't we don't handle as well as we could is the international audience is like how we deal with an international audience and how we internationalize our content um, which considering just the amount of international visitors we have is a little odd um, but that's a really I mean that's a really good From what I understand from translation from German I guess there are more characters and words in the page, like English, German, 
Yeah. Yep. Well, and there's also yeah, and I, there's also a different aesthetic sensibility for you know like a like um, some cultures really need a very very simple straightforward. They don't understand why there's all this stuff on a page. They just want to get to this. Whereas other cultures, um, my favorite is like I think it's the Ling's cars. The, the, I think it's Korean oh, yes. Korean car site that we always put up as like this is the worst site ever. It is so ridiculously successful. Ridiculously successful because in that culture, like they're just used to that. And I'm sure that's not what the author intended. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that's and, and like and that's one of the reasons why, like, as snarky and opinionated as I am, like, I've gotten so, I've changed so much in the way that I think about things because, you know, oh, that's just a crappy user experience. Well, you know, sometimes it's not for someone. You know, I, I did one of my, the most eye-opening projects I did when I was at the User Experience Center was for um, software that monitored industrial equipment for process control engineers. And this thing, literally, you were looking at a blue line and a red line squiggling against a green line, and these four numbers that just constantly changed. And all of us who were like getting ready to evaluate the software were like, who the hell even knows what they're looking at here? This is such an awful experience. I can't even understand. Oh, our job is easy. Anything we do will be an improvement. And the first person that we had who was a process control engineer looking at the software said, okay, well, what do you think you're seeing here? Oh, I'm looking at a really noisy loop. What the hell is all like, why is it moving so much? It shouldn't be, it should be more smooth. And so we found out that the biggest thing that they were looking for was literally how the red and the blue line squiggled against the green line. And they would spend the entire time, no matter what window was in their face, they would move it out so they could see those numbers changing when they changed the value. And so when you, like, whenever we think of, you know, this is just an awful user experience. Ask yourself, well, am I the person who's supposed to be having this experience? Because <laughs> this could be totally fine for me. Uh, you know, this could be awful for me, but for the person who actually is supposed to be having this experience, this could be exactly what they need. So, it has been wonderful hanging out with you today. Thank you very much for coming in. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be out in the hallway.